Oh, <laughs> good morning. Today is the 12th of April, 2013. The show is the Veterans Forum coming to you from the studios of the Derry Community Access Television Greer in Derry, New Hampshire. For those of you who do not know the show or about it, it's something that we've been doing in cooperation with the Library of Congress since 2000, wherein they have asked stations such as this throughout the country if they can and will help record the activities of all the guys and gals who served anywhere in any war for posterity. Each one of them has a story that's unique. We had the same general goal to do what we could to make sure that we did win the war. But more important, how that has impacted upon our lives individually and as a group as to when we got through, what did we do, and how have we done it. But more important, we want to make sure that we record the history as it was made by the people who made it without any embellishment. We've been told several times that uh, there are some people in the world who want to erase their history books because of the atrocities that, if they did reflect them, wouldn't put them in good light even today after things have been over. Once the show is done, copies of the data will be sent to the Library of Congress for their permanent database. And I'll see to it that each guy and gal will get a copy for their own record, and they can show it to their kids. But more important, the grandkids who keep saying, you know, hey, Grandpa, what did you do in the war? Well, <laughs> like me and a lot of other guys who have down for a while, you've got to remember which war it was and how much of it you want to share. But the good part about it, and now time and time again, when the show is over and the mics are dead, the guys look at me and say, you know, phew, thank you. I've been carrying that load for a long time. I haven't told anybody, but I figure it's time to get it done. And that's the bottom line, folks. Each one of us had a job to do, and we did it. But more important, though, if you do not tell your story, <laughs> nobody else will, and that'll be lost forever. So if you are so inclined and can come, please, get a hold of me. The address will be at the back of the program, and we'll do anything and everything that we can to make sure that your story is presented the way you want it to your satisfaction. Now today we have another guy. I'll show you what he used to look like way back when. This is John in the days when he was a youngster. From this point, we'll go forward, introduce him, and then get the show on the road. Sir, would you tell us your name? John Date? B. Robinson. Where do you live? Right now in Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh huh. What were your service and service dates, if you would, so we can get the record straight? I <coughs> spent three years in the United States Marine Corps back from 19, from December 1942 to uh, January 1946. Three years. Good boy. And you're here to talk about it. I'm very fortunate to have survived that Amen. Long. Amen, buddy. Now, we know who you are now, but as I've tried to do, to make this kind of a, this is your life story, and to tell it the way you will if you can. Uh, for example, where and when were you born? How was it growing up before you went into the service, particularly a time we lived through the Great Depression? Any of your family in the service? Anything of member before you got in? And we'll take it after that. Okay, I was uh, born in the Milford, Massachusetts Hospital in, uh, April 30th, 1923. It's next to the little town of Upton, which is close to the city of Worcester, and it's where my grandparents lived. My parents lived in Hardwick, Mass., which is a little town halfway between Worcester and Springfield, off in the boondocks. The uh, early part of my life was a sort of a catastrophe. I was a very as asthmatic, a very sick child, and at the age of four, my grandmother, whose interest was taking care of people, asked if she could take care of me. And I moved to Upton to live with my grandparents for a <coughs> while. The only thing is it turned out to be the rest of my life. The grandparents, my grandfather was a retired captain of a fire department in Worcester. And my grandmother was a school teacher, but she actually delighted in taking care of, in this case, me. 
I grew up in Upton, went to Upton High School, and actually I graduated in 1941, and the, very shortly after that was the Pearl Harbor situation. Initially, I joined the Massachusetts State Guard, and we practiced once a week with broomsticks in the <laughs> town hall. And eventually, it got to the point where I felt I should do something more. I had a distant cousin who was a captain in the Marine Corps, and his suggestion was that if you had any particular particular craft that you were interested or a phase of it you were interested in, the Marine Corps or the Coast Guard was more apt to help you because it was smaller. The Army and the Navy were so large, you were a name and a number, a number and that yeah. was it. So a group of my buddies and I all went to Boston one day to enlist, and they each had different choices. Mine was the Marine Corps. I went in. I, at this time, was physically healthy. You cleared I up passed the asthma. All the, I cleared the asthma. I uh, passed the physical test. I passed the written tests, and I signed up for the Marine Corps met my buddies and each one of them had failed for some reason or other, so I was the only one that succeeded that day. You were so the driver, were you, that brought them not down? Not at all. So you got home all right. I got home all right, and everything was fine. So they made arrangements, and uh, I boarded the train in Boston on uh, December 7th, 1942, and ended up in Paris Island late in the evening. Joined the platoon there, was introduced to Sergeant Wilcox, the most the Careful. most efficient Marine I had ever seen in my life. He was the senior drill instructor at Paris Island at that time. He was a physical giant. He was a nice guy. Everything we did in the uh, Corps from then on was double time. You ran here, there, and every place else, and we would go on double time marches. Sergeant Wilcox would be from the front of the line, he'd run to the rear of the line, he'd run back to the front of the line, he'd pick up the people in the back and the entire trip, and he wasn't even breathing hard at the time. We all collapsed at the it's end. Discouraging, isn't it? He's a fantastic individual. Anyway, I signed up, and as a boy I had been interested in telephone, so I wanted field telephone. And I asked them if I could get into field telephone and they took my name and number and that was it and so forth. After seven weeks, we literally graduated and we were given our assignments. There were two John B. Robinsons in the group. I'm John Brewster and there was John Burgoyne Robinson and we were both given field telephone, oh. interestingly enough. Coincidental, huh? I can't imagine. Anyway, I transferred to Camp Lejeune and there went to field telephone school. Field telephone school was supposed to last for eight weeks, and at the end of seven weeks, we were brought into a, uh, a, a room, three or four of us, and they said they had a super-duper school in Washington, D.C. that they wanted to send someone to. And each one of us uh, were quizzed for qualifications and so forth. Now, little old Upton High School had an excellent math course. Uh, I took algebra, trigonometry, ge plane geometry, solid geometry, and so forth, and apparently none of the others had, so I qualified. And they sent me early to EIC school in Washington, D.C., Electrical Interior Communication, a Navy school. I have no idea why, and it was an eight months course. The case, in this case, I was one Marine in a class of 150 sailors. The, cl the classes wow. started every month, and there was, was one Marine normally in each class. We went through everything. Uh, we were given two or three months of intensive math training, and then we went into, as the thing in a board ship, everything on interior communication, telephone, uh, amplifiers. In fact, we had to build an amplifier from scratch and so forth and so on. It was a marvelous course. The idea was that as a Navy man in particular, you were in the middle of the ocean, and if a thing broke, you had to fix had it to fix regardless. It, right. There was no place that you could go and get a spare piece and so forth. 
So I graduated from EIC school. I graduated second in the class, I believe. Of the 120 or whatever? Yeah, well, actually, they gave an exam every <coughs> Saturday, Saturday morning. And if you scored less than 70, you packed your bag and went home. So we had nowhere near uh, 120 graduates. Oh, but uh, It was a right. decline then. Oh, that's okay. right. Anyway, <coughs> um, I still didn't have any idea why I was trained in all this interior shipboard stuff and so forth. And I shortly was assigned to the beach jumpers. Now, I didn't, I was sent to Norfolk, and no one knew what the beach jumpers were. I'm going to ask the same question. What the heck are they, or were they? And uh, I was told to wait there that the beach jumper organization was there at Norfolk, and they would come in and pick me up. After a couple of weeks, a truck came in, and they loaded up the supplies and so forth, and I was told to get on the truck, and I said to the driver, what's a beach jumper? He said, I can't tell you. <laughs> so we went want. through two or three layers of security and got out in the boondocks and so forth, and we arrived at the camp, and the driver says, see that little cabin over there? He says, with no windows? He says, go in there and sit there until the captain comes. He says, don't stick your nose out of the door. He says, I don't want you to get shot or anything. Oh. Got your so attention. I went in and sat there, and it was a good hour before the captain came in with a sheaf of papers, and he says, uh, sign on these, and I said, what am I signing for? He says, can't tell you till you sign. <laughs> so at this stage, I wasn't going to refuse, so I signed the papers, and it turns out the Beach Jumper organization was a super secret organization. Someone had decided that uh, with the technical equipment they had in those days, and it was largely wire recorders. They hadn't developed tape recorders then. We recorded battle sounds, every type of battle sound, uh, trains, planes, guns, tanks. Small and arms and so forth, machine guns. And then we mounted them <coughs> on a half track with a 600 watt amplifier and we were to make a, sub a landing draw by sound uh, away from the main landing and so forth. We were to be a, a simulated landing. Mm -hmm. All the sounds of another battle group and so forth. And we had a real technical problem. Uh, it was difficult with, the, with that particular equipment to accurately record these sounds. Uh, the way it, a tape recorder handled it was different than a human ear and so forth. So we did all this recording, we used equalizers, we did everything, we made tapes or made wire t connections of everything and played back. They were reasonably authentic. The, the theory was that the half track would be landed, it would be set up, it would be started with a uh, timer on it and at the end of a half an hour, it would blow itself up and uh, so forth. But the question was, uh, what did we, what did the small crew that landed with it do and so forth? Anyway, this was the, uh, the concept of beach jumpers. And the reason for the secrecy, as you can see, is it wouldn't be of any value to us if it was known what, what you were doing. <laughs> the Navy had a similar arrangement that they used on a landing craft. Well, unfortunately, the Navy's never worked. It always got water or something in the equipment. And it was, and in our case, it was difficult to keep the tape recorders going. The tape would break, or the wire would break. We had to tie it together. It, it was not a very successful well, thing. How is it mechanically? It was sand and dirt and dust. It was terrible. Oh. Anyway, at a, at, a, at a point in six months, it was determined it was not feasible and it was canceled. So I was sent back to Washington, D.C., and there they had another assignment. Sound ranging was a feature that the Marine Corps had just become interested in. And I was assigned a sound ranging team in the 1st Marine Division in Quantico. And there we had a, a, a group, a small group, about 12 people, the lieutenant, myself, uh, a group of uh, corporals and PFCs and so forth, and we would become trained in sound ranging. Uh, it, it was a very practical location, and it worked well in uh, practice and so forth, and I made out very well, and all of a sudden, I was yanked out of the 1st Division and put into sound ranging in the 5th Division. And they sent me to Duke University to study the DODAR. The who? 
It's the an doga. acronym. <laughs> Put it in English. <laughs> it stands for detection of distance and range. You know, radar was a popular radar, word. Sonar, so doda. they had to give it some kind of a name. Dada, they yeah. called it dodar. <clears throat> it seems that the Army had sound ranging, uh, had had it for years. It consisted of a battalion of people. It consisted of a uh, probably an eight-mile front or something like that of microphones. They all fed back to a photographic tape. And the sound range of the guns that were picked up were, were on the tape and they were analyzed and then they could determine the actual location of the distant gun oh. and so forth. But it had no application to the Marine Corps. They didn't have that number of personnel. They didn't have the capability of having that large an organization. So Duke, Duke University's physics team had taken over the job of making a small portable unit that would do the same thing. And they came up with this little electronic box, battery powered vacuum tube box that was a timer. If you set two microphones at a distance of two or three hundred feet and you bring the things back to the Doda so-called with telephone wire and connect them up, this zero center indicator indicated time. If a sound wave came down and hit both bikes simultaneously, that was a zero time interval. If the left or the right one was hit be first and then to the other, there was a, a time. And the greater the angle, the longer the time interval. And that would be the distance away from the, the point of sound? Well, actually, what it turned out was it was a, a, a direction. The, the perpendicular bisector of the microphone line was aimed at the general location. And if, of course, the thing it was a zero time, the gun originated somewhere along that line. Well, we set up three positions. And if all three of them intersected at this point, you knew you had the geographical location of the distant gun. These were designed to look only for large guns uh, or mortars, something with a very low frequency. The microphones were designed to work in the uh, three to 10 hertz range. And on that basis, they were not sensitive to human voice. They were not sensitive to rifle fire. They were looking for, Just for that concussion. For that concussion. Anyway, we practiced at Quantico and we had a team. And it was quite successful, although limited range and so forth. So we packed up and they shipped us to Hawaii. Uh, the 5th Marine Division had a camp 50 miles up into the hills on the big island of Hawaii from Hilo called Camp Tarawa. It had been a 1st Division camp at some time and then abandoned and it opened up again for the 5th Division. And there we had unlimited opportunity. The, we were up in, a, in the lava beds of the various volcanoes in Hawaii. We had uh, the 13th Marines artillery there and we had all kinds of big guns to fire and we could range on their, their shell bursts and so forth. And we became an experienced sound ranging team. It worked very well. Uh, we had one long tom that would had a 20 mile range and theoretically at the best of our location, we could locate the gun burst at 20 miles within 100 feet. Wow. Which was pretty, of course, this involved uh, the triangulation, yeah. and the uh, weather conditions and all that that were variables and so forth. But anyway, it worked. So at a particular point in time, we were assigned the, to a troop ship to head we ultimately to Iwo Jima. Um, it turned out to be uh, a major troop arrangement and our equipment was carried on an LST, a landing ship tank, a very slow, oh, yeah. difficult. Uh, actually, uh, our equipment was loaded in and we were on ducks, which could manage both on the land no, and on the amphibian. water and so forth. So we headed for Iwo. We were told afterwards, that that was where we were going and so forth. A long, laborious trip. Unfortunately, uh, I tended to be seasick all the time. Uh, it was not a pleasant trip for me, whether, no matter where I was. When I came over from uh, 
this country to Hawaii, I was seasick when I went to... Uh, all the time? Uh, all the time. Oh, God. One of the problems as, uh, as troops on a, uh, a... You have absolutely nothing to do, no responsibilities, no... We did exercises and whatnot, but I mean, it's like a sailor that's busy. So uh, I had nothing to think about except being seasick, which uh, was very unpleasant. Anyway, I successfully made the date of February 19th for, of 1945 for landing on Iwo Jima. Uh, we were appraised of what it consisted of. It was a small island. Uh, reputedly, it had been bombed and uh, strafed for at least a month beforehand. Th there was no vegetation on it. It had been totally destroyed. And theoretically, the impression we got was this going to be a, uh, a, a real breeze. We're going in and it would be over in a day or two. As far as the con there, there was no evidence of any large Japanese group there. No. The reason for Iwo was that it had two airports. They were desperate at the time of bombing uh, Japan, and there were, of course, all kinds of planes that were damaged, and they wanted a halfway point yeah. for security on the planes and so forth, and Iwo was the ideal spot. It had two very large airports. That's about all there was on the island was the airports, plus a little mountain at the end called Suribachi and so forth. Anyway. Uh, on D-Day, we were scheduled to land on uh, afternoon, not the 8 o'clock in the morning group. Uh, we were going in with our equipment, as with, was the artillery, and we did. Uh, unfortunately, and I don't think anybody paid much attention to it prior to the landing, Iwo was largely lava dust and so forth, and uh, it was ankle deep to walk through this thing. It wasn't sand, it was soft lava, dust, and so forth. And the uh, the duck absolutely could not land. It would sit there yeah, with no its traction, wheels spinning yeah. and so forth, so on. Well, they had Amtraks and various tractor units that would come down and hook onto us, pull us up onto the beach, and then we could move from then on. So we did, we moved up into a pre-assigned location. Now, when I say pre-assigned, we had with us this Commander Martin, who was a, uh, a very high-level member of the uh, uh, National Geodetic Survey Group and so forth, a, a brilliant man. They gave him a, a commander's rating, and he had done a complete detailed study of air photographs of EO, and he gave us uh, locations on the map that had been drawn, characteristic things, uh, uh, rock locations or holes or something where we could set up microphones, that would, we could go in, set it up, and maybe make some kind of a thing until it was accurately surveyed in place and so forth. So we did. It took us a couple of days to get it in operation. Hey, this is always under play, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, everything. Got that. And largely, in this particular case, uh, they had large guns on Suribachi, and they were aiming at our beach area and at the airport area and so forth. It was constant. We very handily found a nice deep hole and set up our fire direction center there and so forth. Our crew consisted of, uh, well, I, I laughingly say wire layers and surveyors. They actually were able to interchange and so forth. But the idea was to get these microphones in a uh, underground location at some distance. The, op the procedure was to have a DODAR unit close by and have three of them in different locations connected by telephone, or to run long telephone lines and have the three DODARs in one location and the microphones spread out someplace. They were your ears. Yeah. Anyway, we elected because of the security of this big hole to have all three dodars in a one location and the wire laying teams ran them out, some of them a mile away and so forth and so on. The idea was to get a fairly large separation so that as you made a plot, it could be reasonably accurate. The closer they were, the less accurate the yeah. triangulation of the line was. Anyway, technically, 
Commander Waller of the uh, 13th Marines was not a sound ranging enthusiast. He was an old time artilleryman. If you don't see him, you don't yeah, fire yeah. at him. Yeah. <laughs> and he didn't give us much cooperation. Oh. He uh, suggested to our lieutenant that we leave our equipment aboard ship and help him carry ammunition and so forth. But anyway, my lieutenant was a very dedicated man. And we came in, we set up, and within a relatively short time, we're giving them accurate locations. And we also could zero in when they return fire and see if their shells landed where they mm -hmm. was. And all of a sudden, Commander Waller decided this was a good thing, and he Get used it from the then group. on. Yeah. Well, anyway, <clears throat> as I understand it, one of the Marines' interests in sound ranging was in every one of the Japanese ca campaigns, they had the technique of hiding a large gun somewhere. And they would fire a very high trajectory fire and hide the gun again almost before the shells landed. And they were harassing fire. They weren't serious, but uh, they'd inevitably fire, fire it into chow lines and things like that that would get your attention. Be uh, uh, very much of a harassment. So they had been totally un unable to locate these. They, they kept away from any flash ranging or aerial observation or anything else. They'd only fire when everything was ideal from their point of view and successfully. So anyway, on Iwo, we had a similar situation. Uh, after the uh, major part of that, and before that, let me get back a little bit. Our initial effort was towards Suribachi. The guns were all aimed from the number one airport towards Sur Suribachi to try to knock out this battery of, of weapons there and weapons, so yeah. forth. This took three or four days, but it was finally accomplished. The, uh, the mountain area was completely cleaned up. That f famous flag raising took place. Uh, we all saw the flag on Suribachi indicating that it was safe to, uh, <laughs> to but don't not look at it. But don't put your head up too high. <laughs> and <clears throat> All we had to do as an artillery organization was turn 180 degrees and we were now facing the other direction. So as far as our sound ranging was concerned, it worked in, the, in either direction and okay. so forth. So it was simple. Um, technically, neither the 13th Marines nor our sound ranging headquarters moved for the entire campaign. You realize there were two other Marine divisions at the same time, the 14th uh, was with the uh, fourth marines and they had the third as a uh, backup and they brought them in in a couple of days and so forth and they were in the other side of the island and further up again uh, it was a very difficult campaign and as we found there were uh, at least 10,000 Japanese there and they were all underground there were tunnels uh, from uh, everywhere they, could, they had these concrete pillboxes with, with underground access. One of them would be cleaned out and the next day would be back in operation again and so forth. It was a very insidious operation. Well, well planned, unfortunately. It was very well planned and it was uh, very successful. Uh, as you know, the uh, fatality and injury rate on uh, Iwo was very high. Amen. And uh, the artillery was essential as a uh, backup f for our, our advancing forces and so forth. But it, uh, it didn't require, the island was small enough, it didn't require moving it. It was no, it, it was a, a very small island. And this campaign that was supposed to be over in a day or two turned out to last a month. But it, uh, and we, as I say, had the uh, hidden gun thing and we successfully pinpointed it. Good. Engineers went up and looked and there was no sign of a gun there. So it turned out that the ultimate was, we knew the low, by now we didn't have to plot it anymore. You knew the readings on the Dodar when that particular gun fired. Our artillery had made a, a test firing a thousand feet to the right and we, val we validated that. And then they stopped firing and put any anti-personnel fire into their, these shells that burst six feet off the ground and spread and so forth. And 
when we got the reading, they fired. And uh, they went up and found the gun laying out there and, and the personnel dispensed with and uh, the gun didn't bother anymore. It, it actually worked. Good. Sound ranging did what it was intended to do where no other form of location would have worked. Okay, so what you, you would be the eyes and ears if you were a gun crew. Did you uh, radio command back to them so that you could give actually them their Actually, their fire direction center was within walking distance of ours, and they sort of uh, joined us. Okay. <laughs> Makes for a better company. Right? Yes. No, it turned out very well, and our mission was accomplished. Uh, the uh, 30 days later, we turned it over to the Army to secure it, and we went back to Hawaii in a very badly dilapidated group right back to Camp Tarawa. I had a small condition on the way back. Uh, I third day out, I thought I was super seasick. I couldn't even straighten out in the bunk. And I crawled a sick bay and they took a look at me and they said, okay, uh, we know what's wrong. They said, you've got a nearly a ruptured appendix and we'll take it out right now, which Whoops. they did. It turned out to be a very beneficial operation. <laughs> <laughs> the troop ships were all equipped with very nice hospitals and medical personnel. And uh, actually, uh, it was a full-fledged operating room with all the lights and oh, whatnot. Yeah. And uh, the, the doctor successfully removed a very red and dangerous-looking appendix and said, see, that's what was wrong. Yeah, the hot <laughs> worm, they call it. <laughs> so we got back to Hawaii. The organization was gradually rebuilt, and uh, the th short time later, we boarded the ship again and headed for Japan. Uh, theoretically, uh, we were going to invade Japan, but by then the atom bomb had been dropped and the war was over. So our assignment was Sasebo in the uh, southern island of Kyushu of Japan the naval base at Sasebo. It was about three or four miles up a major river, and uh, as we landed there, there were uh, six-inch guns all over the thing aimed at. We would never have made it up that river if the, Nobody would. If the war had not been over. We landed in Sasebo. Sasebo had been terribly bombed. There was very little standing. There were, it was a big Navy base, apparently, and they had a lot of uh, warehouse buildings, most of them damaged, but we, there were a few that we could use. But that were quartered. Yeah. And in the area, there were a row of caves filled with military supplies. And my job there was working with a Japanese interpreter, and they brought work crews in every day and cleaned these various caverns out. If it was anything that had pure civilian usage, it was given back to the Japs. If it was pure military, it was taken out and dumped in the ocean. Well, needless to say, truckloads of workers came every day. There was a driver, a male driver, and a male uh, interpreter, and all the rest were female workers. Oh. <laughs> they did a tremendous job, and my job was to work with the uh, interpreter and organize what was coming out and where it was going to go and so forth. The <clears throat> young Jap turned out to be exactly my age, and his name was my, uh, Hayashi Masaki. He had taken English in uh, the equivalent of high school the way I took French and he learned as much English as I did French. We couldn't speak to each other. We could write to <laughs> each other, off. but we couldn't talk to each other. Uh, I was not interested in learning Japanese, and he was terribly interested in learning English. So as soon as the assignment was uh, fixed, and the workers working, Hayashi and I sat and conversed, mm -hmm. very limited. In, in two weeks, we could carry on a conversation. And shortly after that, he was given an assignment to talk to somebody down at our motor pool. And he came back and he said, uh, I couldn't talk to the man down there. He said, uh, he spoke a different language. And I said, I, I don't understand what you mean. I said, we're all Americans. We all speak the same language. And so he says, come and let me show you. We went down there and the chief of the motor pool was a Texan. 
Oh, <laughs> another world, not a he language. <laughs> <laughs> My Hayashi, uh, uh, that fascinated Hayashi. And so from the remainder of the time we were there, the three months or so, he did everything he could to contact every Marine and ask where they were from and if they were slightly different. He, he could mimic almost anybody at the time we left. Including so the Texan? Forth. Yeah, including the Texan. And he, um, he was a very intelligent young man. Uh, we met every morning, we got the assignment and so forth, and his question that morning, is this the day you kill me? And I would say, look, we're not here to kill you. Oh, yes, you are, he said. That's, he said, if we had captured you, that's what we'd do. And I couldn't convince him that regardless of what we did, that that was not his ultimate end. As far as he was concerned, that was perfectly okay. Anybody who wins should kill off the enemy, that's period. There was no, period. no doubt about it. I mean, why would anybody do anything different? <laughs> he found out, and we, we tried to dis compare locations and so forth, and I tried to describe to him that I had gone to boot camp on the, West Co on the East Coast and traveled by train to the West Coast, and it took us nearly a week to cross on a troop train and so he said, I don't understand. He said, uh, he said, there's no place in Japan that we can't go in a day with the yeah. proper equipment and so forth. I said, well, I said, Japan is very small. I said, this, and when, by the time I left, he still couldn't conceive of that much land in, in a solid piece. Uh, he had no idea how large. He said, we a attempted to attack America? No. He said, I couldn't imagine it. He said, I don't know what these people were thinking about. Well, as a man said, we got anyway, the tiger by the tail. <laughs> we uh, completed our mission. Uh, one of the things that was required when we left, uh, they took, as I say, all the uh, military stuff and dumped in the ocean, but it was a vast amount of it. So every Marine had to take a sword and a rifle back. You were automatically given a sword and a, a Japanese sword and rifle to oh, take so. back. I didn't want them and I didn't show up at the uh, dispersal and so forth and I was criticized for this so the captain finally took me in and he said uh, uh, you've got to take them. He said this is better than taking them out and throwing them in the, in the ocean. The ocean. Mm -hmm. Well it turned out that uh, they had brought in a new supply and they had fresh rifles and still in Cosmoline and so forth. They had, they had nice swords and whatnot. So I got the best of the crop by waiting. So I took them with me. And I got back to the States. We arrived back uh, the, the night, uh, the day before Christmas in uh, 1946, back to San Diego. Uh, one of my buddies had a, uh, a family that he was familiar with in, in La Jolla and we went there for Christmas the next day and had a good time and uh, it was a very, we were on our way out, there was no question about it. So as soon as possible I was assigned a train ride to the East Coast. We came, we went in the southern route from uh, from uh, the original boot camp. I went back in the northern route and uh, I recall we were one evening, uh, it was quite late at night, this one of our, my buddies came rushing in and he said, you've all got to go out and see God's country, the most beautiful country in the world. And so we, we were stopped at a, in those days they were steam engines, stopped at a water break and so forth, and we all went out and looked and we were in the middle of Kansas. And there was nothing but tumbleweed, like table. <laughs> tumbleweed going across, and and it was it was sunny. I mean, it was the moon was shining. It was bright. It was uh, it was pleasant looking. But we told him he was crazy, and we all went back to bed anyway. But we arrived in uh, the East Coast and went through the procedure of checking out and so forth. I was uh, given a discharge and a little the back pay and whatnot and so forth and took the train and headed back to Upton, Massachusetts. Arrived there the day after my grandfather died. I got a chance to attend his funeral but I never saw him alive again. And 
things were were pretty hectic. I wanted to go to college, and I applied for uh, several colleges, and to the best of my knowledge, I was accepted at MIT, I was accepted at Worcester Polytech, and some others, but in every case, it was a one or two year wait before I could, because yeah. of the volume of guys coming back, coming back and so forth. <clears throat> well, having been a field telephone man, and having liked telephone and so forth, my next step was to go to the New England Telephone Company and apply for a job. Went into Worcester for the typical examination and I found there were 49 other people, other veterans looking for telephone jobs at the same time. They were given pretty much uh, the mechanical aptitude test, the general classification test, a physical exam, whatnot, and so forth, and I was hired on the spot. And they sent me to Southbridge, Mass. There I became an installer repairman. And it was after the war, things, they had had uh, th three years of telephone orders that had never been filled. It was wow. a tremendous Working operation. Working on OT, huh? Oh, God. They didn't have even the latest t telephones. All they did was have the old desk 10 with it. Mm -hmm. And we went around and tried to catch up with the installation of back orders on tele telephony. The other thing was the old drop wires that ran from the pole to the house were a fiber type covering and so forth. They had a new one with neoprene, but they couldn't make them fast enough. So someone devised a technique of making a, uh, a pole mounted bu paint bucket and we would hook it on the drop wire and fill it up with tar and run it down the thing to the house and co coat this oh, yeah, leaky wire. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a messy operation because the stuff was spattering all over the place and so forth. Not only the ground that went, but ourselves and whatnot. So uh, another one of the new recruits and I were given the job of taking the town of, of Webster the town of uh, Oxford and doing the entire town. We had a telephone truck, we had uh, buckets of paint, we had poles and so forth. And the idea was every day you go and you go to every one of them, you knock on the door and find out the name of the person and what their telephone number was and you went to the telephone book and scratched it out. When the book was all scratched out, it you had done, done the done. job. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't require much uh, training at that stage. Anyway, I became trained eventually as a telephone installer. In those days, the New England Company had a, uh, a technique for assigning each craft had three exams, a basic exam, an advanced exam, and a premium exam, and so forth. And you couldn't progress in the pay scale unless you passed okay. each exam. Yeah. On the other hand, if you did pass the exam, you automatically progressed. They couldn't, it was, a, uh, it was unique in the New England Company for the simple reason that a lot of places went on uh, brown nosing and whatnot and so forth, but not in the New England Company. They, 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 were, they prided themselves that Alexander invented the phone in Boston and boy, they were the best, you know. Amen. <laughs> so anyway, um, I progressed through the three exams I became a local testman, I became a toll testman, I became a toll wire chief. What's the difference, <laughs> if you will? Different levels. Uh, the, uh, the install and repair is the guy that puts the phone from the pole to the house and okay. so forth. The local test man is, sits at a desk with all kinds of dice and determines where the troubles are to dispatch the repairman. But the toll business is totally different. You're now doing long haul circuits to other cities and so forth. And it was a highly technical profession. Toll in the early days uh, was largely vacuum tube amplifiers. Rooms full, Room of, full of heat. Yeah. It was all heat. Yeah. Um, eventually they went into carrier systems where you could get uh, more than one circuit on a pair of wires and so forth in fact you could get a dozen circuits on four wires and uh, of course later on it's gone to much more than that and so forth but it was a uh, a highly technical organization uh, very interesting 
Uh, I, I spent my entire career, uh, except for the last 10 years, in toll. Eventually, and by then, they were beginning to put data on telephone wires between various businesses and so forth. Interestingly enough, the telephone company knew nothing about digital communication, and the, tele the computer people knew nothing about analog communication. And here we are mixing the two and so forth. So the majority of the, uh, the locations ran into trouble. In 1970, a group of uh, vice presidents met in Chicago and were upset with a number of executive complaints on data communication. So they established what they called a, a data technical support team in every Bell company. Realized then it was all AT&T. AT&T owned all the other mm -hmm. companies. So each company set up a data technical report team equipped with special data testing equipment, special training, and whatnot. And by some strange coincidence, I happened to be head the one up in New England. And we eventually had a crew of uh, a second line. I was second line. We had a crew of, uh, of nine first line supervisors, and we covered the entire New England area. And our job was to take every serious communication problem of data and we had 24 hours to resolve it, not to fix it, but to who determined was it ours, was it the Somebody business else, machine? Yeah. No. Who or, owned it? And if we couldn't <clears throat> determine it within 24 hours, our next appointment was for, with Bell Lab, and they would send a man immediately and so forth and so on. In the 10 years I had the job, we had 5,000 or so complaints, and there were only three that we required to call Bell Labs. And of the three, they fixed two of them. One of them was never fixed. <laughs> oh, that bad. winning me down was not too bad service. Not bad at all. Anyway, the, when I left, I retired in 1981. When I left, uh, the fastest digital communication on an ordinary telephone line was 4,800 bits a second. And that was with a very expensive modem, and it was not too dependable. Uh, right now, uh, if, and nobody uses dial-up anymore, but if you did, you can get uh, 4,800 with a little, little chip. Little clip, yeah. It's advanced Scary. fantastically. Scary. You got the world right here in your hand. And as I say, uh, I'm a, I was a wired telephone man. I, I've got a cell phone now. Uh, technically, I still like wires. In the recent Sandy uh, storm, our power was knocked out, our TV was knocked out, but the telephone still worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the status of things now. <laughs> That's uh, a long story. Yeah, well, it's a good story. <laughs> the best part about it is, for, I think I understood some of what you're talking about. I'm electronically, I'm a million miles behind. But what I'd like to do, changing gears, uh, I have, well, you brought some. I'd like to show some of these photographs and have you run through them. And there's one I'm saving for the end. <laughs> uh, we have somebody up there who can really pick this up. There we go. That's, oh. that's the sound ranging team, a part of them in uh, Quantico. And the uh, man at the extreme rear on the left is Lieutenant Bidstrup, who headed us up, a marvelous person. He was a high school teacher in his profession, and of course most of our crew were, uh, were teenagers and so forth. He knew exactly how to handle this group of people. The, the question is, how old was the oldest guy on your team, as far as what, 21, 22? I was the oldest one, and I was in the 21, 20 range. Boy, an old, too old duffer. These huh? were all 17 and 18 year olds. <laughs> all right, and here's another one, the, the classic home away from home, if you will. I That's Camp Tarawa in uh, Hawaii. Hawaii was a, is a m wonderful place. The weather, I went swimming on uh, Fourth of July, it was 72 degrees. I went swimming on Christmas Day, it was 72 degrees. The only place that they had mud was Camp Tarawa because they leveled, they took all the grass off and put tents up. Yeah. Now, 
This is two here. I don't know whether this is. The, I'll start this way. This is your equipment, as I understand it. Oh, let me, here, come on, Robert. Wake up. Uh, that's the there dodar is the timing device in the middle, and the microphones are the uh, ones that we bury in the ground at some distance away, and so forth. Are these are the microphones. These Those are the microphones. Okay. And they were all battery powered. One of them was a six volt battery and therefore we had to have a, a generator to charge those in the field and whatnot. But in a typical vacuum tube, you had to have, have 45 volt batteries. And so it was a, 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 a typical 1945 setup. <laughs> now here's a layout if you want to call it that. It's called a normal installation. It is, and as you can see, we used to, to bury the microphones well, so that they right were. And we dug a hole, and we had a round cover on the thing, and you hung the heavy microphone underneath it, and you had the telephone wire coming out. Now, the problem on EWO was it was this doggone ash stuff. You, couldn't you dig, dig a hole, it. and it fell in. Yeah. Dig a hole, and it fell in. So the guys very ingeniously found an easy solution. They took the empty shell casings and made a thing around the hole and it like wall casing yeah yeah worked now, out very well this is the personal then but i was told by my wife answer the question was he married what about the family if you will well i had a uh, yeah. i had a young lady writing to me while i was in the service when i got home she thanked me for coming home and said uh, that's it so i in turn found another young lady and uh, she was willing in a very short time to marry me. We have three boys, and we have three grandsons, and uh, it's been a, uh, a telephone career of uh, much pleasure for Good. the rest of the time. I really have no complaints of the era since World War II. Okay, so that is a kind of wrap-up kind of thing. Now, when you're home, you said you had trouble getting into schools. Uh, did you join any outfits like the VAW, uh, VFW, American Legion, and so forth? Technically, uh, it was a horrible experience on EWO. I uh, had no interest in uh, in the military, in recalling the military, in joining a mil and I never have. Okay, good answer. <laughs> That's it. Now, with all you said and done, and the experience as we talked before the show, what's your impact? Was your service uh, positive or negative as far as what your life has been like and what it's been able to do too for you? But more important, anything you want to add to the kids coming down the road with respect to how they might want to look at life? Uh, as I indicated, I had spent an early youth sickly period. I was probably an introvert. Uh, I uh, was not socially in it. And I was forced into uh, a situation in uh, the military that was very beneficial for me. I couldn't have been in a training program any better. A college or anything else wouldn't have been as good. As such, uh, it totally changed my outlook in life. It totally changed my future actions and everything else. And as far as I'm concerned, military training uh, almost should be a requirement for everybody on the basis that it uh, organizes and establishes a routine of things that's healthy. Yeah. Amen. I have no complaints. I. I enjoy, as you can see, I spent a lot of time in training that I would have never gotten anyplace else. I got involved in techniques that were new at the time. I've been involved in them ever since. Yeah, it's, and each one led to something bigger and better. It's, uh, it's been an interesting life. Good. I have no complaints. Two words. Thank you, my boy. You're more than Your welcome. I appreciate the opportunity. Glad you were here. Thank you. Folks. As they say professionally, uh, that's a wrap up. But before I do wrap it up, again, I'd like to make one a plea to anybody and everybody out there. If you're a veteran, male or female, Mox Nix, who served in any branch anywhere, and can and will want to come here and share your experiences, we'll give you the best treatment going. 
a lot of people, for some reason, now it sounds silly, but uh, <laughs> I've had guys here who see the camera with a little red dot and they absolutely freak out, but they was bombed, prisoners of war, you name it. Uh, we'll try not to have that sort of treatment. But basically what we're trying to do, as I said at the outlet, we'll say again, those of you who helped make that history, we want to make sure it's correctly recorded for posterity. It'll answer the questions your grandkids will ask, you know, what do you do in the war? But more important, I found out now, having worked with some POWs, for example, that after the show, not being corny, they've said in many words, wow, I finally got rid of that baggage. I'm not that all of you have it. You don't have to be Audie Murphy. But whatever you did was important because one thing led to the other. And that's what we're trying to do is have a continuum of what really happened so that we and people coming after us. And now <laughs> we're becoming an endangered species. Uh, statistically, I was told a few years ago, as World War II, for example, there were some 16 million guys and gals throughout the world doing their thing. About two years ago, I got an update from some sort of statistical basis saying at that time, they estimated there were maybe two, two and a half million of us old guys left. The bad part is, if we don't tell the story, nobody will. But as time marches on, the WW2 guys are starting to fade out. I'm starting to see in the paperwork, he or she was a Vietnam of the Korean War, Vietnam. We hope we can straighten those guys away and have them come back. And the things today, it's going on and on. Each one of us had something to do, and it's our job, if you will, to make sure it's properly recorded and our kids get to understand what it was all about. Bob Stevens saying again, thank you, stay well, and keep in touch. Goodbye.